Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Timeline by Michael Crichton, uh, his best adventure since Jurassic Park, according to the Financial Times. This is a very weird book, it's kind of science fiction and historical fiction merged into one. I'm going to go ahead and read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs and I'll share some overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say I didn't tab out too much, um, and I will talk a little bit more about that at the end. So, blurb. Dane reads. An old man wearing a brown robe is found wandering disoriented in the Arizona desert. He is miles from any human habitation and has no memory of how he got to be there or who he is. The only clue to his identity is the plan of a medieval monastery in his pocket. This mystery will catapult a group of young scientists back to the Middle Ages and into the heart of the Hundred Years' War. So, we're going to go through. Um, so there's a lot of stuff about like quantum computing and quantum mechanics in this which would have been pretty cutting edge at the time. Published 2000, copyright 99. Um, quantum computing is still being like researched today, but not really for these kind of purposes. But um, yeah, it's basically a much more efficient way of computing. It allows like I don't even I don't, I'm not even going to try and explain it because it's hard. So we learn about the um, the president of ITC, which is the company that owns this quantum computing stuff. And he's like a billionaire, eccentric billionaire, and it says board meetings always ran into the night because the ITC president Robert Doniger was a notorious insomniac, and he scheduled them that way. It was a tribute to Doniger's brilliance that the board members, all CEOs and major venture capitalists, came anyway. And um, I mean that's kind of how I work. I work late into the night and then don't go up in the mornings. This line just cracked me up as well. So, uh, Dr. Merrick tells me he's going to be late for his, what is it? My broadsword lesson, Merrick said. His broadsword lesson, yes. Yes, I think he certainly should do that. It doesn't sound like something you can change, like a piano lesson. And um, just this little excerpt here, I'm going to read the full thing because I like this idea. Um, he says, he had a term for people like this, temporal provincials, people who were ignorant of the past and proud of it. Temporal provincials were convinced that the present was the only time that mattered and that anything that had occurred earlier could be safely ignored. The modern world was compelling and new and the past had no bearing on it. Studying history was as pointless as learning Morse code or how to drive a horse-drawn wagon. And the medieval period, all those knights in clanking armour and ladies in gowns and pointy hats, was so obviously irrelevant as to be beneath consideration. Yet the truth was that the modern world was invented in the Middle Ages. Everything from the legal system, to nation-states, to reliance on technology, to the concept of romantic love had first been established in medieval times. These stockbrokers owed the very notion of a market economy to the Middle Ages. And if they didn't know that, then they didn't know the basic facts of who they were, why they did what they did, where they had come from. Professor Johnston often said that if you didn't know history, you didn't know anything. You were a leaf that didn't know it was part of a tree. And um, they're getting dressed up in medieval clothes, because they're basically being sent back in time. Um, and this is actually where it kind of lost me. I found it really fascinating, all the stuff about quantum computing and the stuff about looking back at history from the present day. And then as soon as they got sent back in time, that's where it lost me a little bit. Part of the reason for that is actually because it was using a lot of like old school language, like forsooth and methinks and stuff like that. Despite the fact that they're all wearing these earpieces that can like turn the old language into modern like language that they could understand. So I feel as though it could have just been written in modern language. Now, I think, to be fair, Crichton obviously did it deliberately, and for some readers that would really help to establish like the sense of time and place, but for me it was the opposite and just kind of annoyed me, and so every time it happened it pulled me out of the story. So anyway, they're getting dressed in these old clothes and getting ready to be sent back. We get, you got all this simple, he said, grunting. You just haven't looked at your own clothes lately, Marek said. The average Westerner in the 20th century wears nine to 12 items of daily clothing. Here there are only six. And I was sitting there and I was like, 9 to 12, what am I wearing? I've got socks, so let's be generous and call that two items of clothing. Boxer shorts, jeans, t-shirt. So I'm wearing five items of clothing. So yeah, if I'm wearing five items of clothing, the average is 9 to 12. And he was complaining about six being complicated. Six is complicated. That's one more than I'm wearing, and that's if you count socks as two items. And uh, they feel a bit uncomfortable when they first arrive, and it's because uh, it says here, there's no ambient noise here, no radio or TV, no airplanes, no machinery, no passing cars. In the 20th century, we're so accustomed to hearing sound all the time, the silence feels creepy. So we get some nice sort of gore here in a, a sword fight. Um, 
So we get this. Suddenly to his right, another soldier stepped into the room, his back to Chris as he fought Marek. Their swords clanged. They fought fiercely, but the man had not noticed Chris, and Chris raised his sword, which felt very heavy and unwieldy. He wondered if he could swing it, if he could actually kill the man whose back was turned to him. He lifted the sword, cocked his arm as if he were batting, batting, and prepared to swing, where Marek cut the man's arm off at the shoulder. The dismembered arm shot across the floor and thumped to rest against the wall beneath the window. The man looked astonished for the instant before Marek cut his head off in a single swing, and the head tumbled through the air, banged against the door next to Chris, and fell onto his toes, face downward. Hastily, he jerked his feet away. The head rolled so the face was turned upward, and Chris saw the eyes blink and the mouth move, as if forming words. He backed away. And um, then we get this, which which I just enjoyed this because um, there are two things I want to highlight here. There's the bit about King John the Good, this great line right at the end of this, but also the origins of tennis. The ball rolled on the ground and the men pushed and shoved each other, letting it roll. When it stopped, one man picked it up, cried, Tenny! and served the ball overhand, smacking it with his flat palm. The ball bounced off the side wall of the cloisters. The men yelled and jostled one another for position. Beneath the arches, monks and nobles shouted encouragement, clinking bags of gambling money in their hands. There was a long wooden board attached to one wall, and every time a ball hit that board, making a loud bonk, there were extra shouts of encouragement from the gamblers in the galleries. It took Marek a moment to realise what he was looking at, the earliest form of tennis. Tene, from the server shout, meaning receive it, was a new game, invented just 25 years earlier, and it had become the instant rage of the period. Rackets and nets would come centuries later, for now the game was a variety of handball, played by all classes of society. Children played it in the streets. Among the nobility, the game was so popular that it provoked a trend to build new monasteries, which were abandoned unfurnished once the cloisters had been constructed. Royal families worried that princes neglected their instruction as knights in favour of long hours on the tennis court, often playing by torchlight far into the night. Gambling was ubiquitous. King John II of France, now captive in England, had over the years spent a small fortune to pay his tennis debts. King John was known as John the Good, but it was said that whatever John was good at, it was certainly not tennis. Then there's a guy who's forced to, uh, he's trapped and uh, it says they threw live rats down to him, which he killed and ate raw for 10 years. Imagine that, not very vegan as well, is it? And then uh, Doniger, the uh, CEO of whatever it was, ITC, I want to say it was called, um, he's given a presentation and it says here, across from the narrow stage, three padded booths had been set up all in a row. Each booth contained a desk and chair, a notepad and a glass of water. Each booth was open at the front so that a person in the booth could see only Doniger and not the people in the other booths. This was the way Doniger gave his presentations. It was a trick he had learned from old psychological studies of peer pressure. Each person knew there were people in the other booths, but he couldn't see or hear them. And it put tremendous pressure on the listeners, because they had to worry what the other people were going to do. They had to worry if the other people were going to invest. Very clever, I like that. And another just great little bit of gore and viscera here. Chris at once began to follow when a flaming ball landed at his feet, bounced and rolled to a stop. Through the flames he could see that it was a human head, eyes open, lips drawn back. The flesh burned, the fat popping. A passing soldier kicked it away like a soccer ball. So that's about all I wanted to highlight from Timeline. Basically, I did enjoy this. I would give it a middle of the road 3.5 out of 5. Um, it started really interesting. I loved all the like, science fiction, the speculative sci-fi, all the ideas and the, the questions it kind of raised of you. Um, and I liked when they were looking back at history. And then when they actually travel back in time to history, I just kind of lost interest a bit. It became very much more like plot driven and character driven, which is fine, but just not what I was really expecting and hoping for. I mean, it was still good though, well researched. I did find it annoying that it kept using these like old way of speaking. Um, so like forsooth instead of in truth and all that kind of stuff. Um, it just kind of kept bringing me out of the story. But um, I mean, I can see why he did it. The other thing I was going to say is that it never really explains why this thing works as a time machine. Like it explains that it's to do with parallel universes and they're kind of jumping into parallel universes, but it doesn't explain why they're also traveling in time. Like if they went into a parallel universe where things were different, but it was the same period of time, that would kind of make a lot more sense. But I mean, as I say, it's sci-fi. You've got to do, take a bit of a leap of faith anyway. So there we have it, that's what I made of Timeline by Michael Crichton. And as always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.